Hey there, it's GM Max, and today we will be going through a system against 1d4. Uh, some of you may be coming here from the previous video I did on a creative counterattacking system against 1e4. It felt natural to also suggest a system against d4, and my suggested system in this two part training is the Dutch, specifically the Stonewall Dutch, so that is where after for example, c4, knight f6, and g3, that we're playing e6 and then building the stone wall with our d5. Off where moves like bishop d6, castles, and c6 to follow, just completing this stone wall formation. Now, the first thing that should we point out is that you can't play the stone wall against absolutely everything that they do. It does work fairly well against the kingside fianchetto formation, as we'll see in this training. But it's worth pointing out that if white were to play something like knight to c3, for example, and knight to f3, which is probably what you'll face most often if you're rated below 2000, then the move d5 is not going to be as effective because then white can develop the bishop outside the pawn chain and wilds have too much of a stronghold over their weakness on e5, which is not so much of a problem in some of the, the other lines that we will see. Uh, so other positions where you can try to aim for the stone wall, though, uh, can be if we just go back a, a couple of moves. You can aim for in a few other versions as well. For example, if they play like bishop to g5, then yeah, in some of these lines you will see black playing d5 later on. Or if white plays e3, yeah, again, you'll often see d5 and a, a stone wall sub coming up from there. And of course, if they play something like, let's say, knight to c3, on move to trying to get an e4 quite directly. Then you can play d5 and get that sort of stonewall type of structure once again. So the answer is that, yeah, it depends on how they play it, whether you are going to get the stonewall formation in or whether you're going to be playing in more of like a pure Dutch style. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that there are a few other move orders with which you can play the stonewall Dutch. For example, if you play the French defense as black against 1e4, you could consider playing the move order with e6, the idea being that e4 would just transpose back into the French defense. But if they play a move like c4 or knight f3, that we can then play f5 and you know, head back into this kind of territory. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, do make sure to like and consider subscribing. So let's also see the move order with d5 just briefly. I'm not going to really be covering these in this part, but just showing you some alternative move orders that you may like to explore where, you know, once again, if you do decide to go for this triangle style move order to try to get the Dutch, uh, to try to get the stone wall set up, do keep in mind that you can't do it against everything where, you know, once again, if they play knight f3, you're probably going to want to play something a bit different to f5 here because f5, again, allows white to get that, uh, this bishop f4 setup, which is what we're trying to avoid, where white just, again, has too good a control over the e5 square. Uh, and there also have moves like cd5 and e4, which also would need to be learned. And if they do play e3, yeah, then this is a moment where f5 would, would come up more often. So you can sort of see that you're sort of getting the stone wall up in a decent version, Arguably less often via the triangle move order that we, we see here, which might be something that if you play the semi-slav or slav, you might be considering. Um, also, you can play it with knight f3, c6, and again, in some cases, you can play for f5, like g3, f5, or e3, f5, and you can sort of see you can get the stone wall in a, a few different versions here. But once again, you're not going to get it in every single version where, for example, if queen c2, you know, f5 is not so effective again when they can play bishop f4 and, you know, go for this setup that we saw before. So, again, we have to be a little bit careful with the move order and you also have to be a little mindful of things like, for example, if they play knight f3. If you want to play the triangle setup with the stonewall idea, you are kind of committed to playing e6. So you're not getting move ordered out of the triangle if they do go back to a queen scamp with c4. So if you are looking to sort of play the Stonewall Dutch fire a few different move orders, then these are a few ways in which you can go about it. 
But having done this overview, it's now time to have a look at some uh, some games, as it were, with the uh, the Stonewall Dutch. And the way I've divided it is in this part one training, I'm going to be just looking at games which do feature the Stonewall Sap Rising. Whereas in part two, we'll look at the variations where we don't get the Stonewall and have to pivot a little bit, as it were. So just bear me one sec as I just bring up the games. So our first game here is between Yakovenko against Vallejo, two players rated two seven hundred plus at the time of this game. Uh, so in this case, we see yeah, the Stonewall Sap against the Fianchetto, and it's worth pointing out if you are playing the Dutch at a high level that this Sap is the one you're going to face the most often here. And after knight f3, bishop d6, castles, castles. Uh, the move knight c3 is actually the most common one in the lead chess database, even at high levels of play. But it's also true that the knight is a little bit dominated by our pawns. So it's only a legitimate approach for white, but we'll see that black can be reasonably happy on a strategic level when white, you know, doesn't have the option to bring the knight closer to the e5 hole in sense. Um, and also note, by the way, we're not that concerned about the knight coming into e5 because, yeah, we do have knight d7 to sort of kick it away in a, a certain sense where we can see here white's not really managing to, you know, to keep the knight on e5 in the long term in a, in a variation like this one. So in the game, white plays rook to b1, just very directly going for the queenside uh, minor minority attack. Well, it's not technically a minority if you're in the queenside pawn storm. In turn, black plays the move of knight to e4, trying to slow b4 by pressuring the knight on c3. Of course, if white were to take, we'd be pretty happy to improve our structure like so and open the file for the rook. White plays queen c2, black plays a5 to hold back the b4 push. We have a3, queen e7. Again, everything is aimed against holding back b4. And interestingly enough, after the move, c5 and bishop c7 white actually decides not to play the consistent b4 and go for the pawn storm and i think the reason for this is because after take take and knight d7 and b5 that you know white does get queen side play but we can also hit back with e5 and get quite good counterplay in the center in this case uh for example a move like e3 might look very natural from the human point of view but once we get this pawn to e4, we can see that black just has very good attacking chances on the king side. And can really start playing moves like g5 and h5 and just get a very strong attack on this side of the board. Uh, I can be a lot stronger than what white is mustering on the queen side. Um, you know, b6, we just retreat the bishop. And if they do exchange, well, that just helps our, our bishop get more active. So it shows a little bit of the deadlock that white faces if he plays natural, but not particularly precise moves. So I suppose this explains why Yakovenko went bishop f4 and decided to trade off our good dark squared bishop. Uh, we know it's a good bishop because of our pawns being on the, the light squares. And now bishop d7 was black's attempt to try and activate the bishop. Though I do think maybe it was more precise to play knight d7 and perhaps go for a g5 plan. But as it turned out, this is how the game played out where yeah, white. You could say probably never play played in absolutely the best way. I think this might be a shorter time control game. Because um, here white probably does have quite a nice advantage here. Where you know black went on to win. But I do think that yeah this up is not really ideal from black's point of view. Where white's not able to open up the queen side. And yeah we're not really in time to get the necessary counter play on the king side to, to make this uh, kind of work. Which is one reason why you know instead of maybe the sub that black played in the game. I think I'd probably prefer to play something like knight bd7 here, where if they do play b4, well then we can take this pawn at least it's sort of a gambit by, by white in this case. And now if they do play c5 for a parrot, well, you may already remember the thematic response when they do play c5 is that we just hit with e5 and just get this very good counterplay in the center in a, a structure like this one. Uh, where black is, yeah, definitely doesn't have any problems with, with these squares for his pieces. So that was yeah, the first game I wanted to, to share. Um, the next one is actually by someone who wrote a book on the Stonewall Dutch a few years ago. A game between Jankovic's white against 
GM Nicholas Sedlak as Black, and, well, they're both GMs, but, yeah, in this game we see Black use the move order with, uh, with C6 as such. Um, personally, I actually find the Bishop D6 and Castle's move order, where you delay C6 a little bit more flexible, but that's something we'll get into a bit later in the video. So Black ends up just playing the normal C6, Castle's, Bishop D6... And this time White refines this up a little bit, not playing the immediate Rook B1 that we saw in the previous game, but instead playing Queen to C2 first. And after Knight E4, only then Rook B1 and preparing B4 and B5. After Knight D7, White plays the move B4. And already we can sort of see a little bit of a difference compared to previous game that we're not able just to take on C4 so readily because of the pressure against E4. And I think this is the reason why Sadlak in the game goes b6, just preparing to develop his queen's bishop. And because we saw last game that when the bishop goes around to ed d7 and e8, this like the old school way of playing the Dutch. But it's a little bit inefficient, and still the bishop doesn't do all that much on h5 if, say, the white knight were to move away at some point. Whereas from b7 or a6, the bishop is a bit more flexible and. And it takes less time to develop as well, in a sense. So at this point, White plays a natural and consistent b5, looking to open the queen side in his favor. But after Sedlak's reply, queen c7, it turns out that it's not so easy for White to resolve the queen side tension in his favor, because if White does take, we see that there's a bit of a problem with the pin on the on the c file, as it were, uh, that White can't continue so easily with his plan of you know, destroying the black center. So the idea of bishop d2 is kind of to prepare this a little bit by defending the, the knight on c3 in advance. Black plays the move knight df6. Um, yeah, personally, I think I'd probably lean more towards bishop to b7 and you know, maybe playing it this sort of way where the bishop can sort of open up its diagonal at a good moment. But game saw knight df6, we had takes, queen takes. Um, because the disadvantage of bring the knight to f6 is that you do give white the option of playing knight e5 and you're sort of using this outpost, which I do think would give white a little bit of an edge here after, say, take, take, and yeah, I think that, you know, white should have something to work with here with his, uh, you know, with his bishop pair advantage in a, in a position like this one, let's say, with uh, rook fc1 in the worst case, but in the game, White played knight b5 instead, and this sort of allowed Black to get a decent game after take, take. Yeah, White's basically sacrificing a pawn, but it turns out that with Black having this long diagonal for the bishop, he doesn't really have any problems here. And in the end, Black did go on to win a pretty nice game after take, take. Rook c8, yeah, we see White does get the pawn back, but that Black's majority is sort of more mobile than White's, whereas, you know, White's Pawns are a little bit blockaded on the dark squares here. And with knight d4, knight f3, and c3, yeah, this pawn just becomes more and more of a, a fawn in white side. Uh, just to very quickly show you how the game concluded, you know, black, probably his last two moves weren't the most precise, like just putting a knight on d5 and just keeping this pawn protected seems a lot more logical to me. Um, so yeah, probably the rest of the game is maybe not so relevant from, from this stage, let's say. Uh, but still a very nice win for Black and kind of showing that, you know, the plan of the pawn storm by White is not as scary as it, as it initially appears. Of course, we should just share the usual disclaimer that, you know, the Stonewall Dutch, of course, is an absolute mainline opening and, you know, if White plays all the best moves, then they will get a small edge out of the opening. But on the other hand, we also have a fairly systematic approach and we sort of guarantee a more long-term strategic battle where, you know, perhaps our opponent is not going to be so comfortable Moving on to the next game, and actually these next two games are two games of Magnus Carlsen's, which are very, very instructive, and this first one he played against Caruana in, I believe, the 2015 Granky Chess Classic. Um, if you're wondering, by the way, what the point is of playing c6 rather than the immediate d5, um, we'll see a bit later on that the move knight h3 is one of the more annoying approaches for white in this variation. Uh, and the idea of c6 is that now if they play knight h3, we have the option of going back towards a uh, towards a more like Ilyan Chunevsky Dutch, where we go like castles and e5. And 
Yeah, well, it's still slightly better, but at least it's a way of getting a different sort of setup against Knight A3. Um, so it's a move order you may consider experimenting with in your own time. In this game, though, it just ends up transposing a pretty mainline territory. And, of course, we looked at the move Knight C3 and how that can play out in the previous couple of games. But the main line at a higher level of play is the move of B3, which we'll see in quite a few of the, the next games, in fact. So the idea of B3 is actually not so much to fear and carry the bishop right now, but rather to go bishop A3 and exchange off our good bishop for their, let's say, more passive bishop. So by playing queen E7, we kind of avoid this problem, where if white does want to get in the bishop A3 exchange, he'd have to play a move like A4 and prepare it that way. But A4 also weakens the B4 square, so that should go A5 and have a pretty decent hold over the, you know, over the position, you know, where black is. I think certainly not having any, any massive problems after, say, bishop e7, and, you know, knight can even come to b4 as an alternative to the usual knight bd7 development. But anyhow, the game saw bishop b2, b6, um, and knight e5 is one of more critical approaches, like trying to make it a bit harder for black to develop naturally, but, you know, bishop b7 is pretty convenient here. Um, also by developing our bishop to b7 we do have the option to you know play moves like knight d7 in the future and saying the pawn is defended. That being said knight d7 wouldn't be ideally timed right now because you know white can take and there are some tricks you have to be a bit careful for along the long diagonal where a move like knight dc4 is actually quite unpleasant hitting the bishop on uh, on d6 and you, know, you can't just retreat it because bishop a3 is a bit of a problem. So that's something you need to be a little bit mindful of when you play against a knight e5 approach. And that's why Carlsen played a5 and went for this development instead. After e3, knight a6. Uh, I mean, you could also play knight e4 if you want to. It's a move you can play at different points in these lines. But knight a6 was played and you know, Caruana played knight b1, which might look very strange, but actually it does have some some logic to it in a way where your knight e4 is going to be a bit of an empty shot and it's not hitting the knight. And Carlson decided to unbalance the position a bit, playing bishop e5, d5, and knight e4. And yeah, it's true this pawn e5 does give a lot of space to, to white, but it also does make his structure a little bit less flexible in some cases. Now, the way the game played out, we had queen e2, a4, and probably Caruana did miss some chance to get a little bit of an edge. Where I think that playing like CD5 and you know Bishop A3 would be a little bit unpleasant for Black, just kind of prompting you know some move like Knight C5 or or Knight B4 to kind of you know self pin the Knight in a certain sense. I mean Black shouldn't be doing too badly, but you know why at least does have some some play to work with here. Let's say. But after Knight C3, I think that Black was just doing quite well where with queen b4, black was just putting some pressure on the pawn on c3. And we can also see that the structure becomes a bit more symmetrical, that the white bishops, and especially the bishop on g2, become progressively less effective. And yeah, the way the game played out, Carlsen just did a, a very nice job at just outplaying his opponent. From an ending here that's objectively equal, but which somehow I think is easier for black to play due to how passive the bishop on on uh, g2 is and you know the e5 pawn is also a little bit disconnected and could come under fire if white is not careful you know probably why white had to defend it in retrospect he had to try and get his bishop active as as quickly as possible even at the cost of perhaps weakening the structure but he didn't end up doing that and you know just gradually white you know sort of yeah just had progressively more problems to solve and you know Ian carlson they end up basically getting this this rook ending where you know, the pawn f3 just makes it very hard for for white to kind of free his king properly and yeah even the move g4 in a game wasn't really enough to to save him at the at the end of the day so uh it's a very nice win by by carlson i'm not sure every move of the game but yeah just to, to give you the picture here also the game against anand was maybe in some ways more spectacular so and this was also from the 2015 Grand Key Chess Classic. Um, and I think that Stonewall's kind of opening, it probably suits Carlson's style fairly well in terms of just getting more of a long-term strategic battle. 
And it's also one thing with the Stone Wars is quite a flexible opening. There are often a lot of different subs you can go for in the early middle game. And, you know, again, we can keep in mind that B6 is not so well timed when they have this uh, this trick of Knight C4 to, you know, take advantage of the weakness of long diagonal. So we can't just rely on playing a king, queenside king cutter every single time. And in the game, Carlson went for an alternative plan of A5, which actually his, his old chess trainer, Seaman Atchison, was one of the old experts of Stonewall Dutch, and yeah, often like this A5 and A4 plan. Just a way to try and create some weaknesses on the on the white queen side as such, or you know, get a fawn pawn. And it's true, objectively speaking, white should probably be a little bit better against this plan where, for example, if you're wondering, well, can't white just take the pawn with BA4? Well, yeah, he can take, and it does probably give white a little bit of an edge. But black fish is certainly playable. I mean, white structure does lose some flexibility, and you know, I think you, you can make this work as, as black here. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll be sort of taking on E5 and just saying that the that the white structure has a lot of pawn islands, which you know, makes it a little bit harder to defend in a sense. So I decided to play a bit more classically in the game when you go knight df3, which in snatchers it looks to just focus everything towards the e5 square. I feel that Carlson was doing so sort of reasonably okay in the arising position where once he gets in this a3 move, I think black is pretty comfortable in general. Uh, where after take, take, bishop d7. Yeah, you know, Black just doesn't really have any bad pieces. Like, even the bishop on d7 is going to be reasonably active on a square like h5. And also, one thing you'll often see in these kind of middle games is you'll often see, uh, let's say, if white plays bishop e1, for example, and we play out a few moves, like, you'll often see Black going for, again, this sort of pawn advance on the king side, just trying to create some weaknesses and create some attacking chances against the king. Like, for example, say if we get in g4 and are able to trade off the f3 pawn, well, it also gives a very nice outpost for knight on e4 as such. This perhaps explains why Anand went for the move knight d7, which initially might seem like a strategic ex mistake to exchange off the good knight for the bad bishop. But on the other hand, it's also true white does have the bishop pair and you know, quite a clear plan of pushing on the queen's side, and this is why... Carlson immediately went for queen king side counterplay with h5 and you know try and just push these pawns forward for the attack. White goes bishop e1, defending his bishop from ever being captured, but also shuts the rook in and you know e5 we see black start to just take a little bit of control from this position. So rook d1, queen e6, and yeah, this is really a very dream structure when you have the very strong hold over the center like this. But something you also see in some Slav lines, incidentally. Uh, so to solve this, Anand goes for some very direct play. Like, he does need to go for using this pin and playing e4, because if you don't play e4 here, the pawn on e3 just becomes a little bit of a weakness. So e4 is kind of the attempt to liquidate it as such. But Carlton had prepared a very nice response to this, where he played this move of bishop b2, just massively sharpening the play after takes and queen f2 a2 so white might be winning everything on the king side but black also has this pass a pawn that is very close to queening and of course white can't just take the pawn immediately because bishop d4 does discover a attack on the queen which explains why bishop f2 was playing the game but now g5 keeps the king side closed and from this point yeah anand's had some ways to play that might have kept him in the game, but he, in time pressure, he wasn't able to, you know, to find the best move every single move. And yeah, yeah, it's already very tough for White to survive. And his move of rook e7 and sacking the rook to try and get the attack on the king is certainly a good attempt. But unfortunately for him, the move queen d1 is just deflecting the queen away from the rook. White doesn't have any perpetual check because the king just tucks away. And white has no good answer to the pawn, just queening with a2, a1, and, you know, indeed white did resign from, from this position. Um, normally I wouldn't show, like, a full game because I make the video a bit long, but this one was such a, a great game, I just had to, had to show it to in full. You know, it very clearly shows, like, how you get very good sort of dynamic chances, but from a very solid foundation in the, in the stone wall. Looking at another game, this one was played between Shirov against Ivanchuk, 
I think this game was played in the, the 1990s, I believe. And this one, yeah, we see white again going for this 95 setup. Again, aimed against B6, as you may recall. And this time, yeah, we see basically Shirov going for a very classical setup of basically just focusing everything around the E5 square. And after knight e4, which we kind of know this is a disadvantage of knight f3 sub, it gives e4 to black's knight, because uh, there's no f2, f3 anymore. So white goes knight d3, um, you know, we can probably say in hindsight that bishop f4 is probably a more precise version of his plan, but maybe Shirov was nervous about the move g5 in response, and sort of kicking away the bishop as it were. Uh, but after knight d3, that also allows black to play b6. Now there isn't the pressure against the pawn any longer. After knight f b5, bishop b7. I mean, this is what's so interesting about the Stonewall is that, you know, on paper, you know, after f3, knight f6, like, why achieve this strategic goal of, you know, getting the knight to e5, kicking a knight away from e4. And yet black's position is just completely fine here because, you know, we're able to go c5 and just have very nice play in the center. Uh, showing that, you know, just because we build the stone wall doesn't mean we have to, you know, keep the pawns on, on these squares for the rest of the game. Um, and probably it was the concern about, like, c5 and this sort of thing that perhaps led Shirov to play the prophylactic c5 here. But it's a case where time to cure can also be worse than a disease after knight c5, take, take. Because now black goes e5 and just gets his very mobile center to work with. Our bishop is also going to be very active once it gets to a6, whereas a common theme that you may have already observed as Stonewall is that often it's actually the white light squared bishop that ends up very passive behind our wall of pawns. And this maybe explains why sure I played e4 to try and open things up for the bishop pair at any cost. It's the right idea in theory, but it just doesn't really work out in practice after rook e1, take, take. And d4, like we can see that black just has a very strong pass pawn, very strong bishop. The knight can also come in the attack, and it's it's just a very, very bad position for white. Uh, the game ultimately concluded queen d2, knight g4. Bishop a3 is a good attempt to try and stop a piece landing in on f2, but h5 just deals with the pin very nicely. Um, you know, if queen g5, we do have queen f7, and you know, we are able to keep the uh, keep the initiative in this way. The move bishop a3 in the game was arguably worse, so after queen f7, white still isn't able to challenge along the open file because of our bishop covering the f1 square. And yeah, after a few more moves, we can see that, you know, everything just fell apart for white. Uh, knight f2, very, very nice move by Ivanchuk, where after queen f3, white resigned because, yeah, he's going to get mated with knight f3, knight h3 or queen h1 mates, and, you know, sacking the queen isn't really a solution in a sense. So, a very nice game by Ivanchuk. Again, we can sort of see how only a couple of strategic mistakes, like playing c5 and e4 at the wrong time by white, were enough to get him in very hot water very fast. And I believe this next game here is the final game with this uh, this g3 setup. Actually, not the final game. There is one... Uh, I think it's, yeah, one more after this. Yeah, so... This next game is sort of funny. I mentioned Adjustine before, because actually he is playing black in this game against Nikita Vitrigov, 2700 plus Grandmaster, and who now I believe represents England. And yeah, in this game we see white just go for a slower bishop b2 setup and go you know, to play is somewhat similar in some ways to the Caruana Carlson game, or you know, at least it would be if we had like, you know, the, the sap with knight d2 and so forth. But Vitrigov plays an unusual move order with queen c2. Um, and usually the idea when they play queen c2 in the stone wall is that they want to play c takes d5 and not let you play e takes d5 in response because then the, the pawn on f5 would be hanging as uh, we see here. On the other hand, it turns out the symmetrical structure is really not worse for black. You know, we're going to kick away their queen with, with rook c8 and our knight come to d7 and, and it's just very harmonious for black. In fact, I probably already go as far as to say that after knight c6, um, also, bishop a6 is also interesting, just putting the bishop on a, a very nice diagonal, and you know, it reminds a little bit of the Immortal Zugzwang game now between uh, you know, between Samish against Nimsevich. That one was from a Queen's Indian move order, but interesting to see the, the parallels here. That being said, Adris signs knight c6 is also pretty good after take, take, and knight b5. Um, this looks a little bit annoying at first glance, but... 
Bishop a6 and his pin is a very good counter. Rook fc1, rook a c8. You know, basically the play plays out seemingly in a fairly natural way. You know, e3 maybe is not quite meeting the demands of the position. Like to my mind, just a4 and you know, just breaking that pin right away is the uh, is the first priority. Because what happened in the game is after e3, black exchange, take, 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 take. And was able to sort of recycle his passive bishop with bishop b5. And yeah, it turns out this position is actually quite a bit better for black because we can cause some nettle some problems down the, the c file. Uh, and white's piece a little bit, you know, uncoordinated for the moment. So the game went bishop d2, queen c2. Note that also white's queen can't really invade because we are covering it with the knight. Bishop e1 was played, queen b1, king f1, and... You know, you could just take the pawn with queen takes a2, but I think that, yeah, what black didn't want to allow some counterplay with queen c6 and, you know, this kind of annoying pin. So he decided just to play king f7 and just build up the position a bit more steadily so that if white does play queen c6, well, now we just have bishop to b4 and, and using the pin like so. White played a4. Uh, a4 probably is a mistake here. Like, you probably just have to let go of the of the pawn and you know just try to hang on a pawn down but it's of course not the not the most fun choice by any means uh because the problem with a4 is that now a5 is actually very strong again threatening this bishop to b4 and and using the pin on the on the bishop as such and in the game after king e2 queen c2 yeah we see that black is just steadily advancing with the queen and you know from this point bishop b4 queen e2 and takes you know, black is just up material and he's got a, you know, a decisive pass pawn on the B file. Some more moves were played from here, but the result was never really in doubt. You know, black's got his past uh, B pawn moving and, you know, white never really was able to get any perpetual check chances against the white king. Because you know, if we play a few moves, we can see that, you know, basically, like, if they do try to, to give a perpetual, like, it just, it just doesn't lead anywhere. Like, the knight is just covering everything perfectly. Um, and yeah, white end up just giving up after after some more moves that are maybe not the most relevant for us here. But very nice game by Adjusign showing him you know, outplaying a you know a two seven hundred plus GM with the uh, with the Stonewall Dutch, and again showing how like there are some of these subtle strategic mistakes that that white can easily make in this uh, in this opening. Um, to be fair, CD five probably not that bad for white, but just the way white folded up was in hindsight not particularly good. Next game, and this is sort of the final one for this setup with, you know, g3, bishop, g2, knight f3 in the, the pure Catalan style. It's a game between Trengobob against Illusion. It's a, a relatively old school game. But I include this game because one thing you should know when playing the Stonewall is what to do against the bishop f4 plan, uh, which admittedly is not so trendy nowadays because I think people just don't like, you know, weakening their pawns in front of their king. But it does lead to some interesting strategic questions, and of course we should know how to deal with it. Um, there's actually a lot of decent plans for black here, where I think that the one that I kind of learned about a decade ago was the one where you basically just play like uh, like knight e4 and h6 g5 and just go for this very direct play. Um, nowadays one ninjins kind of like to go a5 and sort of hold off the queen side play a bit, and you're only then kind of go knight e4 and you know, get the plane in this way. But it's the same general idea, like we're still, you know, going for the g5 push and basically playing to attack their king is, is our general plan. And I think that, yeah, even though black won this game, I'm not so, again, not so convinced by this bishop d7 plan. Where I do think, yeah, that, I mean, queen e3 maybe is a little bit fancy. I probably would just play e3 and just kind of leave the the bishop looking like a little bit of a ghost in this uh, in this sort of position. Um, I think this would give white a very nice advantage. So it's sort of a good example showing why I'm not so keen on the bishop d7 e8 plan and why I can't prefer the queenside pin keto and the a5 a4 plans in general. So that being said, let's now have a little bit of a look at some alternative approaches but white can play which still lead to this stonewall type of structure. So this game was played between Zhu and Jun as white against Fidit playing as black. There's a relatively recent game that I think was played in, in Tata Steel from memory, but it shows White going for the Knight H3 plan, and 
if you're wondering why is it that white goes knight a3, well, the idea is that... So you may recall from the previous game that one of the challenges that white faced on a strategic level was that, you know, if uh, if they play bishop f4, like, then their pawns get doubled and it's not so great. But here, white's able to take back with the knight on f4 and, you know, achieve the strategic game of trading off black's good bishop without damaging their pawn structure. Now it turns out you can still play bishop e7 and sort of leave the knight a bit awkward on h3. But you are admittedly losing a tempo when you retreat the bishop in this way. And I think this is a reason why Vidic decided to play bishop e7 instead. Which admittedly is a little bit more passive than putting the bishop on d6. But it's aimed against this bishop f4 exchange of the bishops. Now to knight d2, you know, the normal approach for black in these positions would be just to play c6 and you know, just build up steadily, but the problem with that is that after, say, queen c2, like, if we play just automatic moves for black, white's just very well positioned just to dominate this e5 square by bringing the knight towards d3. Uh, it's a lot more efficient in this version compared to some of the other ones that we've seen. And, yeah, black just ends up being really short a counter play, like, you know, we can already see that your knight for also hits this pawn, which, again, you know, kind of limits our options and, you know, just leaves us very passive. White already has a pretty big advantage with knight f e5 and f3 to kick our knight. So it's a good example of the type of position that we're trying to avoid when playing the stone wall. So Vidit's solution was to play knight c6 and sort of cover the, the e5 square accordingly. e3, a5, you know, going for some counterplay on the, uh, on the queen side. And also, yeah, trying to disrupt the whole knight f3, knight e5 machination. So b3 was played, um... I'm slightly surprised that black didn't play to move a4 directly and you know, just try to loosen up the, the white queen side. It's possibly maybe been concerned about white perhaps taking the pawn or something, but you know, I think again this position is going to be quite decent for black, where we might be down a pawn, but we don't really feel it in a sense. And we do have some ideas to potentially play on the on the light squares as well, now that the c4 square is a bit weakened. But of course there's nothing terribly wrong with the move of b6 in the game either. You know, we also have ideas of trying to develop the bishop a bit more actively in some instances as a, a possible alternative to the usual bishop to b7. And, you know, we actually end up seeing it in the game because here, yeah, I'm not sure if ba4 is necessarily the perfect timing where it's not a terrible move, but I think on a practical level like knight f4 and, you know, just continuing a little bit more steadily is probably the, the approach I prefer as white. And I do think white has a fairly nice advantage in a, in a position like this. Um, you know, you can go g5 and try to get some play, but, you know, it is true that, you know, black's king is a little bit loose in the long term, and, you know, there's maybe a slight lack of harmony in black's position at this point, you could say, whereas white's position, I think, with ideas of, you know, trying to push on the queen side or playing the center will, will harmonize reasonably well. But after ba4, I feel like, yeah, now black gets a bit of a, a better flow going where, you know, knight f4 can be met with queen d7 here, defending the pawn. In the game, White broke the pin with rook e1, and we had queen d7, anticipating knight f4 once again. Take, take, and yeah, White's a pawn up, but I think Black's getting pretty good compensation. And after a minute, I'm a little surprised Black didn't play immediately to move knight e4 and you know, just put the knight in the center. But he decided to be a little more prophylactic and go king h8, and sort of just anticipate any any challenges down this diagonal. With queen b3, knight e4. Knight f4, take, take, and I mean, it's sort of an interesting point that even here, white is still a little bit better if he plays, ex if she plays exactly the right moves. Uh, turns out that she probably had to play queen c2 in, in this position and you know, sort of keep the idea of bringing the knight back into the game in a sense. But instead, queen d1 was played, and this sort of allowed black to go g5 and, and start to get some very nice play, where probably knight h3, as ugly as it looks, might already be necessary to avoid what happens in the game, because after knight e2, knight b4, um, so if the knight was on a3, you know, you'd have that pressure on the g5 pawn to curtail knight b4 to some extent, but here that's just not really a thing, and you know, we sort of see white actually, you know, losing back her material to queen c2, knight a4. You know, black just has a dream position here where, you know, the pawn on a2 is fixed as a weakness, our bishop is a lot better than theirs, and and we even have ideas like a playing on the king side later as well, if white does focus everything on the queen side. 
And in the end, Vike did go on to win a pretty nice game. So it goes to show, like, you don't have to equalize out the opening to necessarily win a game of chess. And the Stonewall's very good at getting this sort of long-term battle where White has to make a lot of challenging strategic decisions and, you know, she only has to mess up one or two and to end up in a somewhat difficult position as we as we saw here. Um, definitely a very interesting game, though, and one that, you know, probably those who are looking for a system against a Stonewall also, I think, can, can learn a lot from some of the possible improvements for white, like knight f4 and so forth. In any case, moving on to, again, a bit more of an old school game, this one between Kramnik against Boreyev, and you know, this time Boreyev was outraged by Kramnik by about 150 points, yet still managed to get a, a very nice win. Uh, that being said, I'm not sure how much it's necessary because the opening, I do think that, again, this this whole plan I mentioned before is, is kind of problematic here, but... In the game, I played knight f4 directly, which, yeah, maybe isn't the most precise version of this plan. After a5, we see black, yeah, going knight a6 and, you know, playing a little bit creatively, you know, realizing that we can't get the usual knight d7 so easily with the pressure on e6. Uh, we had e3, bishop d7, bishop b2. Uh, I'm going to go for this game a little more quickly maybe than I normally would, because I think that, yeah, if white in this position does have various paths to a pleasant edge... I think if you play even a move like knight d3, for example, and just go like knight e2, f3, and just kind of put the knights on f4, e5, I think strategically that's going to be very unpleasant for black, and it's one reason why I showed Vidit's plan of knight c6 instead of the usual c6 plan. Uh, but the way the game played out, yeah, you could say that you know, there was some chance for a4 and trying to get some play in this way, like we've seen in some of the earlier games. But Black end up playing it a little bit more slowly, which I'm, yeah, maybe not the biggest fan of. Like, I do think that at this point, White does have a fairly pleasant advantage and, you know, could have prosecuted with a move like c5 and, you know, just gone for this, this steady advance on the queen side. Instead, though, we played the move a3, which sort of allowed Black to hit back with c5, which, you know, is one of the main pawn breaks for Black in the middle game of the stone wall. And I think that, in the rising position, black is more or less doing okay. Like, you could even go b5 and, you know, it's really maximize the tension and sort of make use of the extra space that these pawns give you early in the game. The way that black played the game, though, with dc4 and b5 is, is definitely not so bad either, though. You know, in the rising position with knight e5. Um, okay, the rest of the game maybe is not so instructive from this point is, is kind of my feeling. Because um, after knight e5, I think that, yeah, the move played the game of Bishop c7 is one I perhaps struggle a little bit to understand, where I think, you know, just playing like c takes d4 or, you know, bc4 would, would be more natural than, you know, in this case, I think white's edge is, is definitely kept to a minimum. Um, no, by the way, knight a5, even though it grabs a pawn, is perhaps not so effective here after cd4 and knight takes d4 and, and knight a, bishop a5. Yeah, you know, we're seeing Black get very good play for the pawn here with his his very active pieces as such. Uh, but anyway, this game, yeah, maybe not the most instructive one, but did, yeah, want to show, like, an old school game so you can kind of see how the ideas of Stonewall kind of developed over the years. Also, here we have a, a nice game between uh, Gelfand against Rajabov, which features, uh, yeah, sort of a slightly different move order by White of playing the move Queen C2. And sort of waiting for this move of c6 before playing the move knight a3. Just trying to get a slightly better version where you avoid like knight c6 plants and such. A possible counter to this move order can be just to play a move like bishop to, to e7 here. And then if they play knight a3, you're still sort of playing your usual system. But where queen c2 is perhaps not so ideal. Of course, I can also be tricky of the move order and play knight f3. And, you know, say that we now have a bishop e7, you know, system rather than a, a bishop d6 system. But still, I mean, you can play like, you know, c6 and knight e4 and you know, there's a really fun plan. We can go like h5, h4 and you know, that's quite a nice idea of report from the recent years that, that gives you quite interesting play. And, you know, in that case also why it might not necessarily play queen c2 as his, his first move, let's say. But in the game we had c6, knight a3, bishop d6 and yeah, I mean, this game kind of shows to some extent what White is aiming for, where, yeah, you can go bishop e7 and try to, you know, push with g5, but I do think objectively White is probably quite a bit better if he just goes, like, knight d2, and, like, let's say if you do play h6, you know, White does have options, which, 
it looks very weird to a human, but, you know, an idea like takes and, and Knight F4 is even possible here for white, where he sort of recycles his dark squid bishop, but then just has a very good grip over the E5 square and you know, can very easily play on the queen side. And I do think this is a very, very comfortable position to play and something I would probably try to avoid as black. Whereas in the game, I think black end up getting a, you know, a more or less playable position. You know, able to avoid the, the bishop b8 idea. And again, we sort of see f3 maybe not being as effective as it, it might look at first glance. Where I think here if black had played like d takes c4 and, and knight b6 and just sort of brought the knight towards the center, uh, you know, with something like this. You know, don't really see any problems for black in this case. Like you've got queen b6, you can sort of put a lot of pressure on the d4 pawn and you know, sort of open up the position in time where, you know, the bishop and the knight off on the king side might look a little bit awkward admittedly. Uh, you know, white can go e4, but, you know, it's still a, still a game of chess from this point. Uh, just a normal, fairly tense position, you could say, uh, where we're going to go like f e4, e5 and sort of free up a ship in that way. So yeah, like as I can sort of see, I don't think this game is super relevant from this point, but at least we kind of see how a, a typical sort of middle game position plays out briefly. This next game between Kayakin against Carlson also features one of these slightly unusual move orders of playing like knight d2 and sort of waiting for bishop d6 and only then playing knight h3. However, I do think this is not the most precise move order by white because then knight c6 and we do get some nice pressure against the d4 pawn as such. You know, knight f3 is strategically what you'd like to play, but now black can take on c4 and you know, get this weird Catalan where the knight is maybe not looking so healthy on h3 anymore. So this is why white played the move of e3, but then black played b6 and, you know, very similar to what we saw in the Zhu Angel and Vidit game, actually. Where black decides, yeah, not to go for the the move a4 that I've kind of been mentioning a few times already, but instead goes for a different approach of bishop a6, which, okay, this is a blitz game, it's true, but yeah, I think that maybe a4, bishop b7 would be the, probably the moves I would prefer in a, in a game setting, even though it's true that all these moves should be relatively playable. Uh, but the next move is quite interesting after knight f4, where black decides to actually give up his dark squared bishop for the knight, which might look very odd that you're just giving white this, you know, the two bishops and this pressure, but in the rising play, you could say that Carlson was able to outplay his opponent, where I do think white is quite significantly better here, that if he plays the right moves, he should just be doing very, very well. Um, for example, I think if white just plays rook c1 and, you know, just kind of looks for the right moment, like to go knight f3 and just kind of like open the position at the right time, then, you know, I do struggle a little bit to see like black's long-term play here. Um, that might look annoying on e4, but you can sort of play around to some extent and just, you know, rely on the fact that when the position opens, this dark squared bishop is going to be a real monster. But in the game, I was maybe a little impulsive with this choice of knight e4 and, and f3. And it's sort of allowed Black to get good play with, like, dc4 and fe4. And, yeah, even though the center looks quite strong, it turns out that if black plays rook d8, it's actually not so easy for white to comfortably defend the, the pawn on d4. Um, obviously, you can't play d5 because, yeah, the pin on the on the undefended rook on e3 becomes a problem then. The next game went a bit differently, where, like, after cd, b3, and d5, I like, would say maybe both players were, yeah, feeling quite inspired and, like, trying to, you know, play very aggressively. But Carlson found this very nice trick of dealing with this pin on the king by by throwing in this a4 into mezzo which then allowed black to sort of trade off the you know the white bishop pair and just get this position where it's just a little bit unpleasant for white you know where the knight c4 fork is saying some problems the white king is maybe a tiny bit open at the moment and yeah rook c3 is admittedly a mistake from this point and yeah black was able to win in a in a very nice fashion like knight c4 and you know setting up this fork is is really quite beautiful here and after rook f3, um, so knight b2 does allow queen b3 that does win back the the piece here. But black just played c5 and yeah, just was able to, to keep control. And, and there weren't that many more moves from here. Like the white king just ended up being way too exposed. And well, turns out the ending is also just winning with this, this monster pass pawn. And yeah, white just resigned it at this point. So uh, 
yeah, that's how that game played out and just check if, yeah, the next game is not really featuring so much for the, uh, for the Stonewall, let's say. So I feel like this actually is probably a good moment to conclude the, the part one of this, uh, of this video as such, where we kind of saw a lot of different ideas within the Stonewall Dutch and within what you could say is the kind of main line of this opening with like G3, E6, uh, Bishop G2 and D5 and you know how these positions play out. You know, we saw plans, you know, after Knight F3, C6, castles Bishop D6, like we saw, you know, plans with like Knight C3, with B3, with the knight coming to e5 and a bit of bishop f4. And we also have some ideas connected with white putting on h3 instead. So I really believe that with the ideas I've shown you here, you kind of know both what to aim for and what to avoid as black. So I really believe you can sort of face the middle games with confidence. So what I'll do is I think that we have so many games I picked, like I actually picked like 33 model games for the, the Dutch. So I'm going to divide it into basically three parts where we rated part one for this, you know, part two are going to focus more on like the other approaches within the complex of white playing the move C4. And then in part three, we're going to sort of wrap things up with some of the sort of anti-Dutch systems where they don't play C4 and, you know, go for some system with say knight F3 or knight C3 or, a, or an early bishop development. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed the video and comment below what was your biggest insight or your main takeaway from today's training. And uh, yeah, if you are interested in private lessons, just uh, you know, feel free to send me a uh, email or a message with links in the description below. Uh, all right, see you in the next training. Take care.